Happy Resurrection Sunday, Faith family. Let's stand together and praise the risen Savior.
Good morning, church family, and welcome to everybody who's a guest with us today. Can't think of a better group of people to be celebrating that Jesus Christ is alive. We gather this morning in his name to worship the one true risen king. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I so enjoyed listening to you sing and worship the Lord together. And man, we gather today just as a wonderful occasion to exalt the name of Jesus. And glad that you're here today. You know, in one of the uh, old Sherlock Holmes mysteries, uh, he and Dr. Watson were out on a camping trip together, and they had a nice campfire going, uh, they had a nice dinner. Um, a little bit later, they, they turned in, ready to hit the sack, get a good night's sleep, but in the middle of the night, a few hours after they had laid their heads down for the evening, Sherlock Holmes wakes up, and he nudges Dr. Watson to wake him up. And he said, Watson, open your eyes, look up at the sky, and tell me what you see. And Watson wiped the sleep from his eyes, and he replied, well, sir, I see millions of stars in the sky. Holmes then asked, well, what does it mean? What does that mean? And the learned Dr. Watson pondered that question for a moment, and then he responded, well, astronomically, it means that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Horologically, it means that it's about a quarter of three in the morning. Theologically, it means that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect it means that we'll have a beautiful day tomorrow. Then Watson asked Sherlock Holmes, what does it mean to you? And Sherlock Holmes just shook his head and said, Watson, you idiot. What it means is that someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes it's easy to miss the obvious, isn't it? And that is nowhere more true than when it comes to Easter Sunday. Sometimes it's just kind of easy to miss what's obvious. Because culturally, Easter means bunnies and pastel colors, right? Seasonally, Easter means that spring has arrived. Academically, it means that kids are on spring break. Commercially, it means that 1.5 billion marshmallow peeps are sold this time of year. But truthfully, Easter is all about the resurrection of Jesus. The fact that Jesus Christ died on a cross was absolutely dead, put in a tomb, and three days later, he came back to life. And as a result, you and I can experience new life in him. That's what Easter is really all about. And we're glad you're here this morning to celebrate that occasion with us. You know, as with any Easter Sunday morning, I imagine there are basically three groups of people here today. Uh, some of you come this morning, you're believers in Jesus, and you have come to celebrate the risen King. It's a special day on the calendar for every follower of Jesus, and so you're here this morning because you want to celebrate. Uh, still others are here today, I would guess that you haven't quite crossed the line of faith and put your faith and trust in Christ, but you're investigating it. You're not, maybe not ready to celebrate, but you are here to investigate his claims, to learn more about what this Jesus says and what it means to become one of his followers. Some of you are here to celebrate. Some of you are here to investigate. And still others are here because you have a drug problem. You know what I'm saying? You have a family member or a friend who drug you here <laughs> against your will, and you're just hoping to get a free lunch out of the deal, right? <laughs> so and I hope you do. I hope you do. Um, but on behalf of all of us who call Liberty our church home, whatever your reason, we are so glad that you're here. And, and I will say, you're not here by accident. Did you know that? Not one of us are here by accident. Not one of you watching online is watching accidentally. The God of the Bible is a God of, of purpose. And so God has purposed that you would be here, that you would hear his word proclaimed, that you would be a part of this celebration of his risen son. So whatever your reason, we're so thrilled that you're here. 
And we really do believe that you're here on purpose. Well, this morning, what I'd like to do is take you back to the day that, that started it all, okay? That first Easter Sunday when Jesus rose from the grave and he appeared to his disciples. Jesus would go on to appear to over 500 witnesses. But what I want to do this morning is focus on this initial appearance to his closest friends, his closest followers, uh, the guys we know as his disciples. And Jesus shows up that first Easter Sunday, and he imparts two things to his, dis to, to his disciples, two things they desperately needed, and I think two things that we need. He wants to impart these same two things to you and I. So we want to take a look this morning at what I'm going to call evidence for the head and hope for the heart. When it comes to Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, Jesus proclaims evidence for the head and hope for the heart because Jesus knew that for his disciples to faithfully carry out his mission, for his disciples to bro boldly proclaim the message of the gospel after he went back to heaven, they would have to be absolutely convinced that he was alive, that he was back from the dead. And so Jesus shows up and the first thing he provides for them is evidence, evidence for the head. Did you know that from the time Jesus was crucified on Good Friday to the time they encountered the risen Christ on Easter Sunday, the disciples, for the most part, really did not believe that he would come back from the grave. They simply were not convinced that it would happen. I mean, they should have believed, right? They should have. Because Jesus, on numerous occasions, told them exactly what would transpire, that he would be crucified, but that he would come back to life on the third day. So he communicated that, that to them. Uh, we find in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, no less than 10 times does he reference his crucifixion and his resurrection. So they, they should have believed, they should have been filled with anticipation but if you've read the accounts of the Gospels, you know that was simply not the case. Maybe we would have hoped that the disciples would have had like a, uh, a countdown to Easter, right? Like because of what Jesus had said, because they knew what was going to happen, maybe we would hope that they would be like, okay, Friday, it's Friday, it's day one, and man, that was terrible. You know, the crucifixion of our leader, of our Savior, of our friend, that was brutal to encounter, but it's just day one. We can get through this, guys. Let's stick together. And then Saturday rolls around, and, and they could have like, okay, we're halfway there. You know, we're almost there. Jesus is coming back to life tomorrow, so if we can just keep it together for another day, things are going to be all right. And then Easter Sunday comes. Resurrection Day comes. And they would be filled with anticipation. And like, okay, guys, this is it. This is prime time now. Jesus is coming back to life today. We can't wait to see him. But there was nothing like that, right? There, there was no countdown to the resurrection. Because for the most part, they didn't believe that Jesus would actually do what he said and come back to life. Well, take a look uh, We've been in the Gospel of Luke for this Easter season. If you're a guest with us today, we've been walking through uh, this uh, last week of Jesus' life, and it concludes today. We're in the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, if you're following along in a Bible. But here's what it says. While they were still talking about this, that is the disciples, because Jesus had already appeared to a, a few people, just not to them yet, and they'd heard some rumors, some buzz that, well, maybe he is alive, is he? He hasn't shown himself to us yet. So they're talking about these things. And look what happens. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? No, there was no countdown going on. When Jesus actually shows up, the freshly risen Christ appears to them. What does it say? Verse 37, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. <laughs> so they might not have believed Jesus would come back from the grave, but they believed in ghosts, well, clearly, right? Maybe it's a ghost. 
And Jesus asked them, why do doubts rise in your minds? And we know why, don't we? I mean, Jesus knew why. It's a rhetorical question. Why do doubts arise in your minds? Well, the reason doubts were so prevalent in their minds, the reason they didn't really believe that Jesus would come back from the grave is because it's just human nature. When we determine something in our minds, it's very hard for us to get off that and, and, and to think something differently. And when our experience confirms something, it's very difficult, no matter what anybody says, once we've determined something, whether it's right or whether it's wrong, once we've determined something in our minds, it's very difficult for us to believe anything differently. And, and the disciples, they, they just believed, like most people, that once somebody's dead, they're dead. They stay dead. They don't come back to life. And that had, for the most part, been their experience. And so their minds are filled with these doubts. And Jesus says, why? Why? Well, because. That's just human nature. Once we determine something, whether it's right or wrong, doesn't matter who tells us something different, we're convinced. That's the way your mind works. That's the way my mind works. Um, give you an example of that. Um, I'm not a big fan of seafood, okay? That's not, my, that's not really my thing. I mean, if it's, if it's perfectly fried, like at Long John Silver's or someplace like that, then, then, then it's good. But, but other than that, seafood is just really not my thing. I'm convinced of that, okay? My mind is determined. It's just not, I, just don't, I just don't like it. Um, however, okay, I've got people in my life uh, people I love, some of you, actually, who keep telling me how great sushi is. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, it's not you, I guess. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, as a Pastor Andrew, you got to try, this is great, man, we're going to this new sushi restaurant, you want to come? And you know, I just got people constantly, and I'm like, I'm not buying it, man. I, I, I don't think it's any good. A, a few years ago, I was out to eat with some Liberty Church family members, actually, and, and one of them ordered sushi, and they thought, Pastor Andrew, you got to try this. And I said, all right, all right, all right. I've never tried it before. I'll try it. It was awful. <laughs> Terrible. Never want to do that again. Okay. And so now what my, 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 my mind was made up. Sushi is no good. Now my experience has confirmed it. it it's awful. I don't, I don't like it. Okay. No matter what anybody says, no matter how much I love them or how convinced they are, I, I'm, unless God miraculously opens up my mind and my taste buds to the glories of sushi, I hope to never eat it again. <laughs> Amen. And so the disciples' experience with death had been just that. Dead people stay dead. This is, just, this, is, this is our experience. This is what we believe. Dead people don't come back to life. Well, 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 the disciples did see Lazarus come back to life, right? So maybe they should have had a little bit more faith. But perhaps they were like, okay, well, but now Jesus is dead. We watched him die. And so there's nobody to bring Jesus back to life. And they were convinced in their minds that just, it just couldn't happen. They had these doubts. And so what does Jesus do? When he shows up, he gives them evidence for the mind. Let's take a look. Um, verse 38, he provides some evidence. Go back to verse 38. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. So Jesus just says, look guys, look, look at my hands, my feet, touch me. If I were a ghost, you know, your, your hand would pass right through me. That's not what happened. You can touch me. You can see that I'm real. It's really me. I have come back to life from the dead. And he continues in verse uh, 41. It says, and while they did and while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And you see what he's doing. He's giving them more evidence, right? Because, because ghosts don't eat, and yet here Jesus, right in their presence,
presence, I mean, he, he wants to convince their mind that he's real. He actually, you know, chokes down a piece of sushi, it looks like, I guess. Um, but you see what he's doing. He's showing them, it's real, I'm back. It's me, I'm alive, it's not a ghost, I'm not a figment of your imagination, I'm not a phantom. I was dead and now I'm alive. He wanted their minds to be convinced of the reality of that truth. And so he shows them. And I know that some of you may read this and say, and understandably, well, okay, Pastor Andrew, I, I want to believe in the resurrection, but I, you know, we don't have the advantage that the disciples had of actually seeing Jesus and touching Jesus and seeing the wounds in his hands and in his feet and watching him eat. We, we don't have that advantage, so it's really hard for me to believe, and I get that, and Jesus got that, actually. Jesus understood that. And I don't know if you know this or not, because Luke doesn't record it in his gospel, but if, but if you go to the gospel of John, on this occasion, when Jesus is showing his hands and his feet, and finally they're convinced that it's really him, look what he says to the disciples in John chapter 20, verse 29. Jesus told them, because you have seen me, you have believed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And you know, he's talking about every one of you who are a believer in Jesus Christ right there. You're blessed. Even though you haven't been able to see it the way they did, you still believe and your mind is convinced that Jesus was dead, but now he's alive. And that's what we celebrate this morning. Uh, but Jesus is not finished providing evidence of his resurrection for the head. He goes on to provide something that, that, that transcends just this one moment in time when they're, when they're touching him and seeing him and watching him eat. He draws the disciples' attention to the prophecies that he has fulfilled. And again, he's, dressing, he's addressing their mind. He, he wants them to be convinced. He's providing evidence. What he says in verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. The entire Old Testament, he says, points to me. And I have fulfilled each and every one of these prophecies. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Man, I love that, don't you? He opened their minds. I pray that every Sunday I get up here. God, open their minds. Help them to see because until God opens our minds, it doesn't, it doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense. When the Bible starts to make sense to you, you know God is working in your heart and in your mind. He's opening it up so that it'll make sense to you, so that you can receive it. God's Spirit is working in your mind. That's what happens here. He opens their minds so they can understand. He points their attention to over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that very clearly are fulfilled in Jesus. I would add, too, that for some of you who may question the validity of the Bible, did you know there are roughly 39 ancient historical sources outside the Bible, written by reputable Jewish, Greek, and Roman historians in the first and second century that all collectively give evidence to the birth, the life, the ministry, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. It is a well-documented event for those who are curious to seek it out. Brooke Foss Westcott was an English scholar and professor at Cambridge University in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, Westcott was known as the academic's academic. And B.F. Westcott said this in reference to the resurrection of Christ. When one accumulates all the evidence, it is not too much to say that there is no historic incident better or more variously supported than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen, friend, there, there is evidence for the head. Jesus provides it for his disciples right here. But... But Jesus doesn't simply address the head. He also addresses the heart because he, want, 
wants us to know, he wanted these disciples to know of God's heartfelt desire to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us. It's not just about the head. It's also about the heart. So Jesus provides hope. In verse 46, it says, He told them, This is what is written, The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. In other words, what happened that first Easter weekend 2,000 years ago was not just for people living back then in that moment in time. What's Jesus say? It's for all people, for all time. It's for every tribe, every nation. This gospel message that Christ died, rose again, and forgiveness of sins and eternal life can be found through believing in him is a message for all time. It's not just that one moment in time 2,000 years ago. It's for you and it's for me. And I want you to think about this. You know, Jesus said, this message will be preached to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And did you know, did you realize that makes what's happening right now on Easter Sunday, 2024 in Spring Lake, North Carolina, I am preaching this message and proclaiming this message and you are participating in this service by listening to this message and you and I right now are fulfilling that prophecy that Jesus made. The message will be preached. And now 2,000 years later, here we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Many of you already have placed your faith in him. You've repented of your sin and turned to the Lord for salvation. And right here in Luke 24, you and I are part of fulfilling that prophecy. Well, many of you did come to church this morning and And you've opened up your life to Jesus. You have repented of your sin. You've believed the gospel. And Jesus is your leader. He's your Lord. He's your rescuer. But some of you came this morning and and you haven't made peace with God through Jesus Christ. He wants to be your rescuer. He wants to be your savior. And perhaps today he's determined will be your day of salvation. Easter Sunday, 2024 right here at Liberty Church. God has opened your mind and your heart. And you just know that His Spirit is calling you to believe in Him, to receive Him. And some of you may feel as though you've lived too long without Jesus, or you've gone so far in the other direction that there's just no way to come back, and and shame and guilt and the consequences of of poor decisions have weighed upon you and and they're like a, a barrier between you making that change to turn back to Christ, to repent of your sins and believe in him. And so maybe it's shame or guilt that's keeping you from crossing the line of faith this morning. Others may feel um, differently. Others may feel, you know, I'm not such a bad person. Do I really need to be rescued Do I really need a a savior? I mean, hey, I look around. There's a lot worse sinners than me. And we we can play that game of comparison sometimes, right? Like, I I know some people who need a savior. I'm not so bad. And here's what I would say to each and every one of you. Wherever you are on that spectrum or anywhere in between, all of us have sinned and fall short of God's standard. Each and every one of us, you, me, grandma, everybody, we've all sinned and fall short of God's standard. And we all need to be rescued. We all need a Savior. You know, Jesus came to die on the cross. He rose again on the third day for a purpose. Because God saw your need and my need and the fact that we could never bridge the gap and get to heaven on our own. And the wages of sin is death, not just physical death, eternal death. But Jesus came to bring life. So God has taken the initiative to establish a relationship with you, to give hope for your heart. And he's just waiting on you to respond and open, to accept the invitation to let him be your rescuer 
and your Savior. There was a story uh, in the news several years ago, and maybe some of you heard this. I'll close with this. But this story was about a lady named Terry Horton. She was 73 years old. She was a truck driver who lived in a trailer park in Costa Mesa, California. And one day, Terry Horton was at a flea market, and just impulsively, she decided she was going to get a gag gift for one of her friends. And so she ended up purchasing for $5 this uh, big, giant, gaudy, wood-framed piece of artwork. Again, she only paid $5 for it. The thing was massive. She finally gets it home to her mobile home, and it's so big she can't even fit it through the door of her trailer. And actually, here's a, here's a picture of Terry Horton uh, with the painting. And uh, I, I'm not an art fan, okay? I'm not an art critic, but it looks like a three-year-old got loose in the studio on this painting, right? Um, but I remember on the news, she's recounting the story to this reporter. She's telling the story about this, this painting. It's pretty fascinating. And she says in uh, what I would call a, a raspy you know, tobacco-soaked <laughs> voice. Uh, Terry Horton said, uh, uh, you know, I, I called my friend, and I, and I got this painting home. I called my friend. I said, hey, I got something for you, but, but, I, but I can't bring it to you. I want you to come to my, my place and see it. And so her friend, you know, comes over, and, and Terry Horton continues with this reporter. She says, so my friend got here, and, uh, and we all got a, we got a good laugh out of this, this painting, but she said, I, I got no place in my house for that. You know, I can't even get it back to my house. I, I, you know, I don't really want it, but it's really funny. It's a good gag gift. And, and so we didn't, we didn't know what to do with it. We just decided we'd lean it up against the trailer and throw darts at it. But then we got to drinking. We got to drinking, we got to laughing, we got to talking, we never got around to throwing darts at that painting. And so now she doesn't really know what to do with this, you know, monstrosity of a painting. She can't even get it in the door of her her trailer, so she decides that she's going to have a yard sale, and maybe she could recoup her $5 by selling this piece of artwork. And lo and behold, again, you can't make this stuff up, lo and behold, the art teacher from the local high school shows up at this yard sale. And she says to Terry Horton, I think you have a very valuable painting here. Well, what I think this is, is an original painting by the famous artist Jackson Pollock. And Terry Horton said, um, well, honey, I don't know who the blankety blank Jackson Pollock is. And, uh, and, and the, and the art teacher said, well, you know, I know a forensic scientist. If you're interested, I, I'm serious, this could, be, this could be authentic. If you're interested, I could get him to check it out for you. And so she said, yeah, sure, go, go ahead. There was no signature on the painting, but this art teacher took it to this, her friend, the forensic scientist, and they found a paint-smudged fingerprint on the back of the canvas And they took that fingerprint and compared it to a fingerprint found in Jackson Pollock's studio, even though he had long since passed. They compared the fingerprints, and sure enough, it was a match. And that gag gift that Terry Horton paid $5 for ended up fetching $140 million for her. Well, why do I tell you that story on Easter Sunday? (laughs) Because in many ways, that's my story, and that's your story. You know, no matter who you are or what you've done, what's your background, what's your history, you know the thing that makes you so valuable, the the, 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 the thing that makes all people, every tribe, every nation, so valuable is that every human life bears the fingerprint of their creator. Genesis says that God created you, and he created you in his image. 
And that makes every single person here this morning or watching online of extreme value to God. And God so loved you, he so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't have to perish but could have everlasting life. You and I should never question our value. Jesus gave his life. He rose from the grave on the third day to rescue you and I from the due penalty of our sins. God would have never sent Jesus. Jesus would have never accepted the cross or came back to life on the third day if you weren't of extreme value to him. Way more than $140 million dollars Jesus gave his life so that you and I, sinners like us, could find new life in him. So God has taken the initiative. He sent Jesus. The cross and the resurrection, those things happened. And the reason they happened is because God loves you. He's just waiting on you to respond to his love. Have you opened up your life to him? Have you admitted that you're a sinner in need of rescue? Because Jesus is ready to save you. He is the Savior. He wants to be your Savior. And maybe Easter Sunday 2024 is your day of salvation. Let me ask you to bow, if you would, please. I want to invite our worship arts team to come back out. We're going to close with a final song but in these sacred moments let's just let the Holy Spirit have a have a little time to work in our hearts and remember what I said at the outset nobody's here by accident nobody's watching online accidentally God had you in mind to be here this morning hearing this word because he wants to have a relationship with you He's provided evidence for the head. He provides hope for the heart. Now he's just waiting for you to respond. Why not make today your day of salvation? What, what's, what's holding you back? So the wages of sin is death. All of us are going to die. We're going to spend eternity somewhere. And Jesus Christ came so that you and I might not need to experience the condemnation that our sins so deserve. He has provided a way of rescue, your faith in Christ. So maybe this morning in your heart, you say, Dear Lord Jesus, you've opened my mind, you've opened my heart. I understand that I'm not here by accident today, and you're calling me to be part of your family. I want to be your son, your daughter. I want to experience the freedom and the forgiveness, the rescue that comes through faith in what you've done on the cross and in the empty tomb. And if that's your prayer this morning, Jesus will save you right where you sit. That's his promise. He will become your rescuer, your leader, and your Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, this morning we ask that for each and every one of us, our minds and our hearts would be opened to what your word has been teaching us, that we would not resist the promptings of your Holy Spirit, and that not one person would leave this place this morning or be watching online that doesn't make peace with you through your son Jesus. Your word says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so our prayer this morning is that each and every soul would, be, would find peace with you and experience the rescue that only Jesus can provide. We pray that in the powerful, precious name of your risen Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.